good afternoon all on behalf of our uh, management uh, principal and faculty members of uh, department of tripoli panimalar institute of technology i welcome you all for the aict sponsored short term training program on electrical vehicle technology for the session we are having a eminent speaker ms radhika somakumar assistant professor tripoli department agni college of engineering and technology she completed her undergraduation in electrical and electronics engineering and her masters in power electronics and drives from the calicut university kerala she joined hcl and served as a technical support officer for almost one year and later joined vvit calicut university and works as a assistant professor for almost 4 years currently she is working in agni college of technology she has co-authored a textbook titled test engineering by chess Educa by chess educational publishers in 2018 she received the emerging faculty award in engineering in 2015 by the society for education and applied research nit suratkal she has published more than 10 scopus uh, index paper and filed one patent with this a uh, few introduction i request uh, professor radhika somakumar to take over the session please ma'am good afternoon to one and all uh, thank you sir for the warm introduction thank you and uh, first of am i audible sir yeah audible ma'am roy this is thank you. very clear and uh, first of all i would like to thank uh, oh, thank you sir so uh, first of all i would like to thank um, hod triple dr rama prabha ma'am for giving me this great opportunity uh, to be a part of this aict sponsored sctp electric vehicle technology thank you ma'am and i really feel uh, immense pleasure and honor so also i would like to uh, congratulate the team and the management for conducting this successful event uh, in a very uh, efficient manner so congratulations and uh, i believe without any delay we can get started with the session so sir is my screen visible uh, yes ma'am screen is visible uh, okay so that i will is it okay sir yes ma'am maybe, maybe i go with the presentation Present mode. yeah okay so uh, the power system infrastructure um, is witnessing uh, so many significant changes uh, due to rising concern of global warming as we all know so um, we are in a need for a, a better sustainable grid so to enhance the um, efficiency reliability and uh, the eco friendly energy production probably green energy production uh, we need to integrate renewable energy sources so th this has been taken as a primary objective in the recent uh, years and according to uh, uh, provisional data or the statistical uh, report by by the indian government there is a substantial growth of around 25% uh, in the renewable energy generation and a target has been set uh, to further increase the renewable power capacity to uh, 175 gigawatt by 2022 so to coordinate this uh, massive integration of uh, res renewable energy sources and to maintain security reliability and uh, efficiency of the grid um, we need to re uh, restructure the traditional power system architecture so here the concept of smart grid comes into play it has emerged to incorporate um, with a bidirectional uh by directional power flow as well as digital communication in all levels of the um power system or electrical uh, power system so uh 
in, in support of this uh, restructured power system architecture, uh, we could effectively integrate the uh, conventional generators also, conventional controllable generators even. And uh, as we know, uh, the combined heat and power-based energy sources. Then uh, another uh, one is the energy storage units. Uh, energy storage units and a group of uh, controllable loads. Obviously, uh, the sources and loads. So these all together create the microgrids. And uh, in this scenario, the distributed energy uh, sources, especially uh, which you call RES and uh, CHV based sources, then uh, energy storage uh, units, all these have uh, transformed the uh, passive uh, passive distribution uh, th that which we have the passive distribution network to active distribution uh, networks. So with this, we get uh, we it gives us scope for the uh, bi-directional power flow between uh, distributed energy sources and the main grid. So uh, so why uh, we have to go for microgrid or what is the difference between the main grid and uh, microgrid? So the United States Department of Energy Microgrid Exchange Group defines a microgrid as a, a group, group of interconnected loads and distributed energy sources within clearly defined electri electrical boundaries that acts as a single controllable uh, entity with respect to the grid. So it could be either uh, connected to the grid or it could work uh, in islanded mode, both the ways it's correct. So this is the definition provided by United States Department of Energy. Uh, and uh, also it could be comprising of uh, low voltage distribution systems with uh, distributed energy sources uh, like fuel cell, PV, wind turbine. And also it may uh, contain storage devices. So storage devices like batteries, uh, flywheels, and then finally, the flexible loads, controllable and uh, non-controllable loads. So such systems can uh, operate either connected or disconnected from the main grid, as I said, islanded mode or connected mode. So the uh, operation of these sources in the network uh, can provide benefits to the overall system performance if it is managed and coordinated uh, eff efficiently. So now uh, the microgrids could be uh, categorized into four main types, which are uh, large grid connected microgrids. So I shall explain in detail. Large grid connected microgrids, uh, such as military bases, large campus applications, uh, they are connected to the traditional, uh, the, our normal grid even, but capable of operating in islanded mode. So they have multiple generators and uh, may have substantial uh, dis uh, distribution and uh, some sophisticated controls within the microgrid. So this could come under the large grid connected uh, microgrids. And the second classification is a small, small grid connected microgrids. So uh, they may have a genset and uh, this genset could be supplemented with storage and uh, storage and R renewable RES. Uh, Grid connected microgrids are typically in uh, in developing countries. With uh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Uh, am I audible? Um, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, we were discussing about uh, small grid connected microgrids. So uh, they. Uh, yeah, they, they would not have any significant distribution with the grid, but they could have additional um, load management and other controls. So it could more uh, commonly be manual, manually uh, controlled. So may, many uh, as such do not consider the, these as to be as microgrids. Uh, but then um, as we saw in the definition given by United States Department, uh, all these characteristics uh, do contribute to that of a yeah, microgrid. And then the third one is large remote microgrids. So uh, large remote microgrids such as uh, island lute, lute, uh, utilities, uh, which have multiple generators and substantial distribution. So it is mainly categorized based upon the uh, gen sets 
and the substantial distribution. And then finally, the small remote microgrids. Uh, so this will usually uh, not have more than one genset. It will be very small in structure and uh, they do not have step up transformers for distribution or such methods. So this would be the small ones. So these are the types of uh, microgrids. Now, moving on to the next slide. Here I have uh, given a typical microgrid architecture and uh, it shows the various components and uh, layers present in the microgrid. As we can see here, we have a management layer uh, in which the demand side management is also included. And then we have a component layer. So in component layer, mainly you could see the um, uh, it is connected to various uh, DERs, diesel engine, battery, flywheel, then PV array, wind turbine. And in, in it is connected to the loads by means of power converters, various power converters, depending upon the uh, RES we have chosen. And then we have a central controller, microgrid central controller over here. Uh, so here the uh, main, mainly uh, our energy management and uh, all these things will be carried out in this control layer. And then finally, all together is connected to the uh, external grid. So this is uh, here I have given the uh, typical microgrid architecture. So in between, we could also see the uh, communication uh, communication bus bars have been connected. Okay, And uh, we have uh, SCADA and operator GUI in the demand side. So altogether, this contributes towards a, a typical microgrid. So uh, this uh, various microgrids to the external grid is coordinated through uh, communication, uh, communication infrastructure, which could be also named as wide area network or uh, wide area management systems. So within each microgrid, the coordination and uh, coordination and control among various uh, controllable loads and DERs will be carried out. We have loads and DERs over here. So it is carried out with the help of a wide area network or wide area management uh, systems. Also, uh, it could be accomplished using neighborhood area network because, uh, but then I'm mainly concentrating on the uh, load dispatch side. So I'm not much into uh, this uh, communication uh, or wide area network, but then uh, we have various uh, wide area network and wide area management systems uh, to carry out the communication between uh, various DERs and connected loads. So this is about, and also uh, these microgrids uh, will be usually equipped with, uh, as we, so central controller, it would be equipped with a uh, very sophisticated energy management system because then only we are able to yield um, um, the, or optimize the operation and control of the uh, microgrids. So again, here we have so many uncertain and unpredictable conditions. So uh, as we know, uh, the RES, renewable energy sources, would be uh, very uncertain and unpredictable. So we, we may have intermittent sources, power balancing issues may happen um, between the supply and demand side. So also it is highly dependent upon the weather conditions. So all these uh, complications are present. But then by, uh, by using various techniques, we could uh, subdue and maintain uh, constant power, or we could maintain power system uh, flexibility. So the economic dispatch problem, yes, the economic dispatch problem also occurs due to these uncertainties. So these are to be uh, solved by uh, adopting um, various optimization techniques. So I have a slide for that also to show the uh, classification of the optimization uh, techniques. So it would come under robust, then problem, uh, probabilistic based approaches, statistical planning and all. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, here I have taken up a system over, overview is given. So here the, uh, yeah, we have, uh, various uh, DERs and loads connected to a common system. So we have a system operator over here. The system operator would be exchanging demand response signals uh, with the aggregators 
and in turn the aggregators would be communicating with the various uh, consumers so it could be uh, here in this particular example or uh, case study they have taken residential areas as well as working areas so here if you see in working areas we have electric vehicles connected electric vehicles are connected to the charging stations uh, and uh, we have a com uh, one common aggregator over here and so this aggregator would be exchanging the demand so demand response signals what do you mean by demand response demand response signals are uh, the communication that happens between the aggregators and consumers so if we have excess power generation in our area so this could be uh, this could be sold Uh, through the aggregators to the uh, system operator and then to the main grid so that we could get benefited by the tariff if uh, we have excess energy during peak load demand time so at that time we could sell the excess power generated to the system operator or to the power grid through system operator so uh, the all these communications it's a two way communication and it is carried out between the aggregator and the consumer similarly we have uh, so here another residential and business area is considered so it will be also communicating with the sensor aggregator over here and load prediction so uh, load prediction is they they would ask uh, about uh, the expected load that would be happening so that if at all it is at the peak time they would be uh, displaying or exchanging the tariff rates with us so accordingly we could decide and get benefited so that is one uh, advantage over here and then uh, the electrical loads and the power generated wind turbine uh, the energy from wind and solar uh, could be uh, connected with the system operator and the by fed to the uh, main grid so here also solar generation the data and the scheduling signals will be exchanged with the system operator and accordingly we could decide whether to uh, feed the power grid or whether to store the energy because energy storage is also having a very uh, significant role in microgrids so and then obviously we'll be having um, conventional generation system because diesel engines and hydro power plants definitely will be present so considering all those uh, one case study has been portrayed over here so now moving on to the so uh the electric vehicles and vehicle to grid concept so this is one uh, main concept that we can or main option that we can uh, use to achieve the transition to decarbonized uh, or de decarbonizing society and evs can behave as both load and energy storage systems because uh, when we have excess or we have excess generation of solar and wind energy these electric vehicles could be scheduled could be scheduled in such a manner that the batteries could be fully charged and kept and during the peak load demand time we could exchange the energy from stored in the batteries of electric vehicle to the uh, to satisfy the load demand so it act as both a uh, load as well as it would be acting as a uh, energy storage system so this help to improve the renewable energy consumption uh, economic efficiency and reducing the Uh, network losses similarly the uh, ghg emission yeah um, when we go for green energy the greenhouse gas emissions will be in turn reduced so all together it uh, it helps to control the additional emissions happening and here the uncertainty prediction sets so uh, when we consider electric vehicles one main problem that we encounter is uh, we don't have a scheduled uh, scheduled method because of state of charge uh, and then uh, it depends upon how we schedule the charging of electric vehicles so this is a one uncertainty and then uh, the intermittent and indispatchable nature of wind power and solar energy so this is another Uh, uncertainty that may occur and uh, by regulating the charging and discharging of electric vehicles one main thing what we can do is uh, we could increase the absorption ratio of renewable energy systems as i told in the previous slide we could improve the uh, absorption ratio or uh, utilization of renewable energy sources by means of regulating the charging and discharging of 
electric vehicles. So this will help to um, you know uh, overcome the you know, diverse constraints. And then the third one would be the robustness and economy of the system would be uh, increased, would be quantified, and sensitivity analysis of these variables are to be carried out in future in order to get better performance. So uh, again, it would be the same uh, meaning, the inference that we have got from the uh, discussions carried out. So here, mm, we need to consider multi-objective functions because when we go for a single objective function, all our uh, needs are not satisfied. So we need to go for uh, multi-objective functions and uh, optimize. So optimization would be a basic tool uh, for solving these problems and finding out a global solution among the feasible uh, solutions. So to achieve the, uh, this uh, particular robustness in the system, uh, we need to minimize the operational and generation power cost, operational cost, maintenance cost, along with the uh, operation of a power system in a sustainable manner. So uh, here again, the uh, problem optimization uh, technique uh, could be uh, summarized into three steps, constructing a model, determining the problem type, and selecting software. So all these things I have been uh, doing when I uh, did my literature review uh, for, the economic, uh, for solving the economic dispatch problem. So these were the steps that I followed. And an essential step would be the optimization process. So uh, we need to find out which optimization technique would be the uh, most suitable one for our uh, demonstrated model or our developed model. So for this, I have put up um, optimization taxonomy. So optimization could be divided into three categories, uncertainty, deterministic, and uh, multi-objective optimization. So and there are numerous techniques. So in this, uh, the uh, under uncertainty, we have stochastic programming and robust optimization. So stochastic programming and robust op optimization are the most po popular uh, frameworks for explicitly incorporating uncertainty. So stochastic programming, when we say it uses random variables, random variables with uh, specified probability distributions to categorize the uncertainty. So random variables are uh, used under the stochastic programming and it optimizes the expected value of the objective function. And coming to robust optimization, it is a field of uh, optimization theory that deals with optimization problems in within a certain measure of robustness. So uh, again, it is sought against uncertainty and that can be um, it, it could be represented as, as a um, variability in the value of parameters of the problem or uh, its solution. So one, um, dealing with the random variables, another dealing with the uncertainty that could be. So these two come under uh, uncertainty. And uh, moving on to deterministic optimization, the, these are typically used when the uh, locating the for locating global um, solution. So when it is extremely difficult to find a feasible solution in such conditions, so when the user decides to locate the best uh, possible solution for a problem. And then finally, moving on to multi-objective optimization. Uh, here, uh, uh, yeah, here the uh, it is an area of uh, critical decision of making criti uh, uh, critical decision and it is concerned mainly with the mathematical optimization. So the problems involving more than one objective, as I told, uh, we, if we need to satisfy all our issues, we need to go for multi-objective optimization. So uh, this, uh, these uh, the problems involving more than one objective function. Okay, so multi-objective optimization uh, is applied in many fields of science including engineering, as we know, there are so many multi-objective optimization techniques emerging nowadays, and um, mainly for minimizing the cost and uh, uh, for um, economic dispatch problems and uh, fuel consumption emission of pollutants of a vehicle. So all these comes under um, multi-objective optimization. And then next I would like to, because mainly I am working in this area, uh, power dispatch of microgrids. So 
as we discussed, microgrids consist of various uh, DGs, energy storage devices, then controllable, non-controllable -control loads, and which could be operated in islanded as well as grid-connected mode. So uh, the control and management, we could uh, take it as a multi-objective mission, uh, which, uh, which uh, comprises of distinct technical areas, time constraints are there, and uh, various physical levels. So uh, hierarchical control scheme. Uh, is required for the uh, microgrid management. So here uh, again, it has been. I will go for the diagram rather. So we have a hierarchical control scheme uh, over here. Uh, you could see we have three levels here mainly. So in the primary level, we have lo local supervision, uh, voltage and current control, and power sharing. This would be happening in the primary level. Okay, and then uh, the secondary level would be uh, power quality control, power flow control, reactive active power control, flow control, and the synchronization control. Okay, and the third one would be, tertiary level would be the economic dispatching and optimization, wherein I am doing my research uh, with the, uh, while uh, assuming various microgrids, how economically we could uh, dispatch the load uh, with minimum cost, uh, with minimum emissions and uh, by including more renewable energy systems. So with this, and uh, when, when we have renewable energy systems, uh, forecasting is something that we cannot avoid, general forecasting. And then microgrid supervision. So mainly I am concentrating on this particular uh, level. And uh, so that is about the hierarchical control in a uh, microgrid. And finally, the energy management system. So uh, coming to energy management system, the intermittent sources yeah, are non-dispatchable uh, and uh, it's having some uh, limitations to provide sufficient amount of demand side, uh, demand side delivery in microgrids. So this is one of the main issue that we, because we have uh, renewable energy sources would be intermittent and uh, indispatchable in nature. So while we have that limitations, we need to provide, uh, we need to meet the demand side supply. So managing that is the um, main problem exis existing in power system. And that is why we need an uh, efficient energy management system. So this energy management system ensures the system reliability, flexibility, and uh, uh, the, the power quality and all these things in an optimized manner. And uh, in rural microgrids, the intermittent sources are incorporated to local microgrid. So as we know, we, uh, we would be having more wind, solar, along with the diesel generators, it is to be club to meet the electrical load demand. So we need a very smart energy management system uh, to control the power flow in the uh, microgrid. So here again, smart grid energy management system, I have given a uh, uh, layout. So here the, we have the uh, management module as well as forecasting module. So from here, the import or export power control would be happening on this side and charge discharge of power control because we have uh, energy storage systems and DGs over here. Okay, so the demand response, uh, yeah, from load, uh, the optimization module would be giving first, first, you would be collecting the market info. Based upon that, input will be given to the grid. Similarly, here management module from load, we would be taking the input and then uh, in order the uh, demand response signals would be sent to the load. Similarly, here uh, we have the charging and discharge power control. So again, management module uh, inputs would be given to the optimization module and then it would be controlling the energy storage system and similar manner uh, from optimization to DGs and then the forecasted data would be fed to the optimization module. So here we have a smart energy management system uh, portrayed in such a manner. And then demand side management. This is also a very good area uh, uh, to do research. Um, so many uh, research works are emerging currently in this area. So demand side management 
yeah as uh, has gained more attention in electric power market domain because um, consumers are to be fed in an economic uh, best economic manner with more power quality so uh, so many scheduling methods are there and uh, uh, it is being followed so most of the demand side management scheme mainly focuses on as i told economics so financial savings system reliability and nowadays environmental aspects are given more important that is the main reason why we are moving on to electric vehicle and green energy so all these uh, points come under the demand side management and then to classify demand side management we have customer induced and utility induced further divided into demand response programs energy conservation and uh, the utility induced uh, strategic load growth and flexible load shaping then it could be either incentive based uh, which means during peak load demand we can give them if they reduce their load consumption they could be given incentive and it could be price based uh, so um, and the price based again in turn depends upon the time of use whether you are using your energy during peak load or uh, valley point at that time um, the time of use and real time pricing so what is the tariff uh, current tariff based upon that it could be and critical peak uh, pricing so this is the demand on the demand side management how you could classify now finally i uh, i have been working in this area so i had prepared accordingly but then uh, the main topic of our uh, sctp is electric vehicle technology so i have put up some statistical data over here and this data has been taken from iea international energy agency 2019 report uh, global ev outlook 2009 and those who are doing research in this area this document would be very very helpful for you also the same they have currently uh, released iea 2020 global ev outlook 2020 that would be also i have taken some data from that uh, document also take a stock projection uh, from 2018 to uh, 2030 so you could see the steep increase uh, in these years so and in future how it would be and uh, um excuse me if the diagram is a little bit blurred so uh, the various electric vehicles how the demand would be and uh, you could see the steep increase in the curves and coming on to the electric car stock so this is from 2010 to 2019 so here the inference is uh, vehicles uh, the annual average increase in the annual average is of 60 percentage in a 5 years period and uh, it is total that 7.2 million of electric cars have been uh, uh, used in the year 2019 so it is such a huge uh, count and even more it's uh, prone to increase and then general impacts of electric vehicles as we know the positive impacts and negative impacts positive reduction of fossil fuel use lower ghg emission integration with renewable energy could be used as a virtual power plant uh, even then smart grid facilities and it is the cheapest mode of transportation then the adverse effect as we know uh, when the load on the power grid is being increased so increased power demand harmonics since uh, battery man when we have charge controllers and battery management system everything comes into play we will be having harmonics and low voltage profile uh, may occur and the transformer power losses so all these would be the adverse effects but then comparing to the positive impacts it could be corrected with the advanced uh, power electronic um, circuits or technology available and then the factors impact uh, affecting the impact of ev charging loads on distribution grids uh, this is again uh, an extension of the ad, uh, uh, adverse effect that is the pev penetration level number of evs being penetrated and then its usage uh, usage pattern usage pattern means the uh, scheduling of charging and discharging of electric vehicles uh, household energy demand because uh, nowadays we could even own private vehicle so the household energy demand and distribution network capacity so all these are the factors affecting the impact of ev charging loads so finally uh, i would like to conclude uh, with the points 
uh, enough efforts have been taken to enhance uh, the planning, operation, and control of microgrids. So there is still even more uh, room for innovations and improvements uh, to develop and uh, you know, to apply various modern control strategies in the microgrids concept. And uh, a better trade-off, so centralized and decentralized. Our energy power generation could be centralized, could be located in a single um, from a single power generation unit, or it could be scattered uh, among the power grid. So it could be decentralized even. And the architectures, the distributed architectures uh, necessary to ease the operation management for the individual players in the emerging power markets. And then uh, risk limiting dispatch models uh, need to be developed uh, for future uh, energy communities like virtual power plants. As I told, uh, EVs could act as virtual power plants. So with the help of electric vehicles and uh, resilient microgrid nature. So these are the points I would like to conclude with. And uh, I have uh, quoted the reference papers from which I have collected these data. In addition to this, I have referred Global EV Outlook 2020 and Global EV Outlook 2019, uh, which would be a very useful document, uh, those who are doing research in this area. So thank you all. Thank you for your patient listening. And uh, I thank the team for giving me such a wonderful opportunity to present in front of uh, various participants. Thank you. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your uh, valuable lecture and uh, thank you for uh, spending your valuable time with us. I hope participants gain uh, more knowledge regarding this microgrid uh, uh, system. And thank you very much for uh, part of our session, ma'am. And I also thank, thank, uh, thank you, ma'am. And I also thank all the participants for uh, participating in this uh, short term training program on electrical vehicle technology. So shortly, the feedback link will be posted in the chat box. So kindly go through the feedback link. And uh, sir, sir, I would like to add on one more point. So if uh, anyone, um, uh, if you are doing your research work or uh, in similar area, please feel free to uh, contact me. It would be really beneficial for me even. Uh, so that if we could do you know, some works together, that would be really beneficial. So please feel free to contact me. I may put my uh, email ID in the chat box. Okay, thank you, ma'am. And uh, thank you, participants, for being a part of this session. Uh, feedback link is posted in the chat box. Kindly go through the feedback link. Feedback is mandatory for your uh, utterance as well as for the e certificate. So kindly go through the feedback link, which is present in the chat box. And we will meet you at another session by tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Thank you.